Hello everybody, welcome back for another video. Hope you're all doing well and that you're all having a fantastic day as always. Leaving a like, leaving a comment, leaving a subscription, leaving the thing where you click the little notification bell. All of these things do help out the channel immensely. Welcome back for another news I missed where I talk about stuff in the cryptocurrency space that happened to be going on, but I missed it at a particular time. <laughs> That's a different way of saying it. And without further ado, <clears throat> let's jump right into it. The capacity to digitally authenticate almost everything and the possibility of monetizing in ways nobody could ever have imagined before these are some of the ways that Amazon's new documentary series called NFT Me introduces non-fungible tokens. The show features artists, collectors, and industry professionals across the world sharing their experiences with NFTs and how the merger between art and technology has positively affected their daily lives in six 30-minute episodes NFT Me introduces 50 pioneers in the NFT space from four different continents, including, it says, American singer Suzanne Green of the Supremes. What? Okay, I didn't assume she'd be in to NFTs. Okay. <clears throat> Queen Diambi Kabatusula of the Democratic Republic of the Congo. Refik Anadola, a digital artist from SpaceX and NASA. Peter Roffelson, a music producer for Madonna. Okay. Uh, and Cheryl Douglas of Portion. What's Portion? Cheryl Douglas of Portion, who launched NFT collections for the Black Eyed Peas. The first episode explores the NFT community and the journey of different people through different culture with leading influencers breaking down NFTs and blockchain technology. I won't lie. Am I, I'm like super interested in it because I want to see exactly what they talk about and kind of more so also how they talk about it. I'm pretty sure I'm going to be watching it. I have like nearly every single, and it's a shame too, I have like nearly every single streaming platform and I like watch two of them. So the other five just kind of sit there all the time. But I haven't been on Amazon Prime in a while, so I assume it's time for me to go and uh, click back on it again. Anyway, cool. Yeah, I mentioned earlier this year uh, to the uh, dissatisfaction and dismay of many within the cryptocurrency space and this channel that NFTs were more than likely uh, probably going to become an everyday part of life, but they simply won't be called NFTs at some point in the future. Or even the idea of a, of a digital collectible is also, uh, I think as digital things become more and more valued and we spend more and more of our times online, especially with the alleged beginning advent of the metaverse uh, coming our way sometime over the course of next year from multiple different companies. We will get used to simply having like digital versions or digital things in general as we explore and basically live inside of these worlds. Once again, if you've never seen uh, Unreal Engine 5, go look at it. Unreal Engine 5. Look at videos of it on YouTube. It'll change your life and you'll understand exactly why a lot of people are um, getting ready for the metaverse. That's the Amazon has a brand new documentary called NFT Me. All one word. I don't know why they didn't separate that, but I guess it looks fancier that way. I'm not really sure. And without further ado, let's move on. Also in the news... The US SEC has given the green light to nine more blockchain-based focused enabled funds from the $82 billion asset manager known as Wisdom Tree. None of these funds track crypto assets themselves, but the firm does utilize the Ethereum and Stellar blockchains to keep a secondary record of shared ownership thus making them blockchain-enabled or digital funds as Wisdom Tree describes them. The firm, announced, the, firm, the firm announced the SEC's approval on the 14th of December 
and outlined that nine digital funds offer exposure to a host of different asset classes such as equities, commodities, and floating rate treasuries. Those all had an ease at the end. The funds are expected to launch via the Wisdom Tree Prime mobile app in the first quarter of 2023. There's a lot of, over the last couple of days and couple of weeks, a lot of it is making in, into news I missed, uh, where a lot of the companies who tried before to have a Bitcoin slash Ethereum ETF are now basically coming to terms with the fact that the SEC is corrupt and won't give them the funds that they were asking for. So they're kind of just making, dare I say, anything else that is blockchain and or crypto kind of focus. I think there was something about that the last couple of days as well. There's also the grayscale thing and a lot of other companies who I think we've had like 30 at least over the last six years who've been actively trying to get a Bitcoin ETF or an any kind of crypto, actual physical crypto ETF push through, but none of them are working. So a lot of times we do get news that it, that the US SEC has allowed another uh, futures ETF to go through or something like blockchain base that deals in it in some sort of way. So I guess the news is here that the US SEC gave the green light to nine blockchain funds that are going to have and also be written on the Ethereum and Stellar blockchains as well. So not the most exciting thing, but you know, when you deal or have an SEC like this one, uh, not many amazing things are going to be happening for our industry, at least not from them, because, you know, corruption is still a word. That's the US SEC green light to Wisdom Tree for their nine blockchain based Ethereum and Stellar secondary record ownership funds. I, I tried. All right. Let's move on. In like. What? News? Europe is apparently significantly more metaverse ready than the rest of the world. Yeah, you heard that correctly. A company called U-Switch, that is the letter U and then switch, all one word. A UK-based price comparison service and switching website, I don't know what that means, established in the year 2000, has conducted a study determining which countries around the world are the most metaverse ready. In the beginning, the company identified several metaverse-related elements. U-Switch stated that to participate in the metaverse, users should have both virtual and augmented reality headsets. I don't... That's, wow, genius of them. How else were we, were we supposed to... On top of that, based on the study from Ice Connect, there's another website, it says Ice and then Connect, users would need to have a broadband speed of at least... 1,000 megabytes per second. I, that's MBPS, 1,000 MBPS. The company considered several elements, including fixed broadband speed, broadband package, blockchain financial service startups, high technology exports, and annual Google searches. On the top of the list, you switch named the Netherlands as the, I'm as surprised as you. Named the Netherlands as the most metaverse-ready country in the world. Okay. The, Nether the Netherlands has one of the highest fixed broadband speeds of 106.51 Mbps. On top of that, the Netherlands produced around $5,700 in high technology exports per capita in 2021. Use which gave the country a 7.71 .71 readiness point out of 10. Very weird because I myself, I would have assumed it was like Norway or Sweden, like one of the like really, you know, um, crypto techno startup kind of countries that, you know, okay. In second place, there is Switzerland. Uh, on top of that, apparently they have very fast broadband. Congratulations to them. I hope they all live well. In third place, also interesting was Lithuania yeah see none of yeah none of these is none of these would have ever made it to the top of my list if I had to make like the top five places I thought were like internet ready for the metaverse uh, Lithuania is apparently number three uh the country offers whoa 
The country offers one of the cheapest monthly broadband packages. It is $11 per month. What? Their, in their internet packages are $11.13 per month. Well, I'm overpaying. It is worth noting that the you switch list of the top 10 metaverse-ready countries, nine of them are in Europe. And apparently they are uh, Malta, France, Sweden, the United Kingdom, Denmark, Luxembourg, and the last one... Okay, yay! The, oh, anyway, the last... <laughs> I saw my name. The last one's Canada. So I was like, yeah, I'm metaverse, metaverse ready. Anyway, that's the, I would have, I would have never put any of those on a list. I honestly would not have put Malta. I would have put Sweden, France, my, my internet in France years ago was one of the worst. I won't even name companies. Uh, but there's a company that's just more terrible than the rest, and they, it was horrible internet. Uh, the UK, okay, 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 okay. I was like halfway there. Denmark and Sweden, I, I expected. Like, I, they're very, uh, the word's not tech savvy, but like they're basically living in like 2028, and you think I'm joking. Go look at some of the stuff that they're doing. They're, they're not, we're not in the same world anymore. They basically don't even use cash, and I mean like, they, you know, no ATMs, like everyone is simply using the chip in their hand or tapping their card or like uh, scanning QR codes. It's all a very, it's a very different world. Anyway, cool. Um, I don't think we're going to be getting any news in the future about like the Netherlands, you know, being the dominating uh, metaverse force, but it's nice that they have quick internet. I wish I had some of that. That'd be kind of nice. All right. Let's move on. Also in the news, a third-party vendor related to Gemini appears to have suffered a data breach on or before the 13th of December. According to documents obtained by Cointelegraph, hackers gained access to, okay, 5.7 million lines of information pertaining to Gemini customers' email addresses and partial phone numbers. In the case of the latter, hackers apparently did not gain access to the full phone numbers as certain numeric digits were obfuscated. Thank goodness that they, that Gemini did whatever they did. After the news came to light, Gemini has since clarified in a blog post that the breach appeared to be the result of an incident at a third-party vendor, but also warned of ongoing phishing campaigns as a result of the data leak. The data leak did not include sensitive personal information such as names, addresses, and other, thank goodness. No, like actually, there was, what other crypto, I, I, this was a while ago, like the, the amount of information these people have, you sit there and you're like, oh my gosh, it's so ridiculous. But banks also have the exact same thing. A lot of people, uh, a lot of people tend to focus on like the negativity of the cryptocurrency space or how bad things are, or how this is this and this needs to work better. People don't realize that banks get hacked all the time. I mean, it's like multiple times a day that people are constantly trying to get inside there. And this is why there's such, especially, no, nope. I can't even say like in the US, but around the world, but like why there's such a huge amount of like uh, fraud and stuff like that is because the banks apparently have very bad security over and over and over, so it's very easy to get people's information. So always make sure to watch out. Uh, yeah, so apparently Gemini said that the issue was from another company. Uh, they have people's partial phone numbers, so amazing. If they have your email address, just look out for something you know that doesn't look real. You can usually sometimes tell. Uh, you also should not be clicking any unfamiliar links in any email that you're getting. If you happen to get an email that looks unfamiliar or doesn't look right or isn't spelled correctly or has a random link or they're asking you for information that you've never been asked for before, they're, they're, they're trying to get you. Don't, uh, don't let them get you. That's the Gemini data breach from a third-party vendor news. Be careful out there. Yeah. Let's move on. 
Also in, sure, why not? Institutions in Bermuda will soon be able to trade real-time settlements using a stable coin with a one-to-one peg to the United States dollar. Jewel Bank founder and chairman Chance Barnett told Toy Telegraph, Coin Telegraph, English, called Jewel USD or JUSD. Uh, the first stable coin to be released in the territory is powered by the Polygon blockchain, enabling transactions between wallets available to institutional clients. In the future, the bank plans to use the Polygon ecosystem for commercial and retail stablecoin-based payment solutions, including transactions between institutions and businesses and payments between individuals. Logically, I would assume so if they are a bank. They said the need for a USD real-time settlement network outside of the United States is significant for both fintechs and digital asset firms who are filling a large gap in the market. The U.S. has solutions like Signature Signet for real-time settlement. And now Jewel Bank is providing a Bermuda-based non-U.S. solution for the industry. And the response by clients in signing up prior to launch has been significant. 25 stablecoins are currently traded on the Polygon blockchain, including a synthetic euro, a yen-pegged Japanese stablecoin, and a South African stablecoin pegged one-to-one with the RAND, as you would assume, because it is a stablecoin. Polygon is constantly getting a lot of use, uh, period. Uh, The other portion of this is, with the alleged next year advent of the creation of or the launching of all these central bank digital currencies by the central banks, we're seeing an increased amount of um, issuance and creation of stable coins by other companies, and in this case, also Jewel Bank as well. Um, I usually would ask, why not simply just use Tether or another already established stable coin? But that's not how the world works. Uh, you as a company or an institution or a bank want to create your own coin that other people are then forced or have to use so that when they use your coin, you get paid from the actual transactions uh, through it. I assume that this will mainly be uh, for institutions and banks and other larger businesses, if you will, for quite a while because a number of countries have already launched their central bank digital currencies and no one's using them. So you don't want to launch something that no one's actually using. This is why he said... The signups are, have been quite significant for people who are looking to push around or move around 25 million, what have you, dollars at any given time. So, uh, no, I was going to say cool, but it's not cool because they're simply just trying to create all these things as a as a replica for actual uh, decentralized cryptocurrencies. But we're going to see more and more of this because that's going to be the theme of next year. It's going to be metaverse and stablecoin central bank digital currencies are going to be Launching is just a matter of which stablecoin central bank digital currency actually ends up uh, collapsing first. That's the Bermuda one-to-one peg jewel bank jewel USD stablecoin news. And yeah, let's move on. Also in the news is Ripple enabled remittances will soon be expanding more further into Africa from 19 European countries via something called Nala, that is N-A-L-A, a a Tanzanian fintech company and an agent of Modular, that is M-O-D-U-L-R, maybe Modular, but there's missing some vowels, a Ripple partner. I told you this months ago. You're seeing the increase in the amount of news now. There is a huge push gigantic push, especially pay attention to where the companies are actually from. A lot of them are created in or are currently American companies. America has not been friendly, has not been friendly to a number of different companies within the cryptocurrency space. And a lot of them announced over the course of this year that they're leaving America. They're no longer doing business there. And the new focus is or focus eyes, not a word, uh, for the cryptocurrency space seemingly appears to be Africa. Latin America, and Southeast Asia. 
These are the portions of the world that have the most unbanked individuals on the planet because banks don't like poor people. So, on top of that as well, it is widely believed that in a future where cryptocurrencies have essentially taken over or are the new payment method, uh, that it will be Africa, Latin America, and Southeast Asia who will be not only benefiting from it the most, but also be the most to uh, grow over the next coming decades. Africa is also, not sure if you follow a lot of like future financial news, Africa is believed to be and is poised to become probably uh, the next America. I know that Africa is one continent. I get it. I, I know how geography works. Uh, but Africa is expected to basically continuously blossom uh, because of the interest of the countries, the people, but also the population growth is expected to far outsurpass basically everywhere else on the planet. And they have a rapidly growing fintech sector as well. This is why we keep hearing about Africa in the cryptocurrency space over and over in the news. In February of 2022, payments platform Modular announced a partnership with Ripple to enable seamless payments in the United Kingdom and in Europa. Together, the two fintechs intend to allow businesses to run real-time payments internationally, powered by Ripple's financial technology known as RippleNet. Here's the tweet for it right here. It says, Nala, an agent of Ripple partner Modular, expands into the European market, enabling remittances to Africa from 19 U.S. countries, in addition to the current U.S. and U.K. corridors, Hashtag XRP the standard. Nala made his entry into the United Kingdom market powered by Modular when it became an electronic money directive EMD agent through its collaboration with the Ripple partner. Last month, Ripple officially announced its arrival in Africa in collaboration with MFS Africa, a digital payment gateway. MFS Africa will use Ripple's on-demand liquidity solution. That is XRP for those of you who didn't know. Ripple's on-demand liquidity solution for crypto-enabled payments to enable individuals and businesses in Africa to make real-time payments across borders using their mobile phones, all powered by Ripple's financial technology known as RippleNet. I don't think that anybody from Ripple is actively watching uh, this channel, but I'm glad you took my advice regardless. Two years ago, I was like, just leave. The, the, the U.S. for some reason isn't going to get it together. I think that what's happening myself, I think what's happening in the United States is the U.S. is trying to actively create their own central bank digital currency, of course, but I think that they think that they can do stuff without other people. Like, I think that they think that the cryptocurrency space won't move on without them until they release cryptocurrency regulations or whatever they actually need to do the same exact thing with the uh, with the ETFs within the United States. They mentioned for years, basically, you know, the market's not going to move without us. And look at that. The rest of the world continues spinning regardless of what the US SEC is actually uh, trying to do. Ripple's collaboration with MFS Africa follows the addition of many new on-demand liquidity customers Expanding into new markets, including Lemonway, TravelX Bank, and Singapore-based payments firm FOMOPay. They also partnered with, I think, the Central Bank of Dubai and another bank in the UAE a couple of weeks ago as well. We keep getting constant news about Nigeria and about five other countries in Africa as well, who are also other companies and or banks in these regions who are also using uh, XRP to send payments as well. It says, currently on-demand liquidity conducts millions of transactions worth billions of dollars and allows payouts in roughly 40 countries, including Singapore, Brazil, Malaysia, Poland, Indonesia, and Thailand. Very, very fascinating to see this like level of growth while basically uh, the cryptocurrency market is a bit staggered at the moment. But once again, this is also the time when you do grow when you do create a lot of these things and when you form these partnerships, I am very, I mean, capital, V-E-R-Y, interested to see where XRP's price is going to be if Ripple wins the lawsuit and when we have the next bull run. Because 
for those of you who who, who missed the news story, uh, XRP hit three dollars and sixty cents on a rumor in twenty seventeen that it was going to be listed on Coinbase. Never happened. I'm going to assume with it actually being used by at least thirty different countries, companies in different countries on the planet. And the also rapid accumulation that we're seeing as well, uh, the lawsuit almost ending, and uh, Ripple no longer holding more than 50% of all the XRP, uh, how high this coin can go. Previous estimates were $10. I, 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 think, it's, I, I think we're setting ourselves up for another uh, leg up that's probably going to be quite significantly higher than that. Yeah. That's the Ripple uh, has partnered with Modular and they now have remittances between Africa and 19 different European countries all using XRP. Fantastic. Yeah, that's the Ripple XRP news. And let's move on. I, For some reason, I knew I didn't click it. I don't know why it was in my head. I was like, I, I simply didn't click it. I do hope... <laughs> That you've all enjoyed. I do hope that you all are having a great day, great morning, great afternoon, great evening, wherever you are, wherever you might be. I do hope it's absolutely fantastic. Hope you all are managing to have a good holiday season. Hope some of you got some days off, got some rest, were able to sleep in. Uh, for those of you who didn't, uh, tell your boss that you, I don't know, I, I can't think of a, a good enough lie. I also don't want to get you in trouble. So, I hope you find time to do something fun, relaxing, and to enjoy yourself. And I will most certainly be talking to you all soon. See you.